Good, good afternoon. I, I'm happy to be here. Um, the idea today is to share a bit about uh, uh, what we do in France uh, against cybercrime. So it's not really related to your conference, but uh, uh, it's uh, actually a very technical topic on, on some aspects. It's also a sociological s um, subject, and uh, it's something that I suppose you've all been confronted with at some point in time, and you might have a role uh, to play in, uh, in this area. Um, so just a few words about, about myself. I'm a, a colonel with the, the Gendarmerie Nationale. Uh, that's one of the, the two national police forces in France. Uh, we're in charge of everything that's outside big cities. Uh, so that's roughly half the population and 95% of the, the territory. Um, and in the Gendarmerie, we have uh, 100,000 uh, police officers um, doing all sorts of police activi activities. So from criminal investigations to uh, uh, safety on uh, highways, etc. Um, my background is technical. I uh, entered the Gendarmerie as a, an engineer uh, back in uh, 95. And since 1998, uh, I've been working on the cybercrime related topics. Uh, first in a, a forensic laboratory as a, a head of our forensic uh, IT laboratory uh, near Paris, and um, then I've uh, been in different positions looking at strategy against cybercrime, uh, managing a cybercrime unit at, at a national level uh, most recently. And since um, last May, I've been appointed as a chief digital strategy officer. Um, it's a new position that we've opened uh, uh, in our organization to deal with digital transformation and uh, our strategy against cyber threats. So it's, it still has a cyber aspect, but we also try to cover all uh, other aspects of innovation uh, related to uh, digital tools, techniques, methods, uh, platforms to uh, enhance the, the work of uh, our law enforcement agency and our relationship with the, uh, the public. So it's, um, it's actually a very interesting new challenge. Um, but I'll be focusing on uh, cybercrime in my talk. Uh, the idea is to give you a view of uh, how things have evolved over the, the past 20 years. Uh, I'm not going, going to cover everything, so it's going to focus on, on roughly three aspects. Um, but if you have questions more generally about uh, uh, how we envisage uh, the di digital transformation of our organization. Feel free to ask those questions uh, at the end of the, the talk, uh, if you wish. So we have roughly 30 minutes and then 10 minutes for questions and then you need to uh, rush uh, for your social events. Okay? So that, that was about me. Um, so just to give you a, a broader focus to be sure that you understand uh, all the actors uh, in terms of uh, law enforcement. Um, so Interpol, that's the police cooperation uh, organization at an international level. Uh, the main base, the main headquarters for uh, cyber are in Singapore. It used to be in Lyon uh, where uh, Interpol is still uh, uh, set, but uh, there's a special uh, team uh, that was set up uh, five years ago uh, in Singapore. It's in the Interpol International Global Complex for uh, Innovation, and they uh, they have uh, the cybercrime division there. Um, it's people from law enforcement, but also people from the private sector who work together. Now, if you look at Europol in Europe, the police cooperation organization is Europol. Uh, there's a special unit that was created in 2015. Uh, it's called the European Cybercrime Center, and it's organized on um, three main pillars. One is uh, called Cyborg, as you can see on, on the left, uh, against cyber attacks, malware, etc. The second is called Terminal, against uh, credit card fraud. And the third one is called Twins, uh, that's against child pornography. So those are the three main priorities, but actually uh, they tend to also work on uh, uh, 
uh, drug trafficking on the internet, money laundering, etc., all other aspects that are uh, related to uh, the cyber arena. Um, today, I guess there are around uh, 80 or 100 uh, staff at, uh, at Europol dealing with, uh, with cybercrime. And uh, it's, um, since 2000, 2015, it's made us uh, do a lot of progress. Uh, so it's uh, a, good, uh, a good opportunity that was developed there. In France, so coming back to France, uh, I told you there are two national police forces. One is called uh, Police Nationale, the National Police. The second is called the Gendarmerie. Uh, we also have customs. Uh, we also have uh, consumer protection agencies and so on. But the two main actors are, are the police and the Gendarmerie. And for the Gendarmerie, our uh, network of specialized investigators is called Cyber Gend, or Cyber Gendarmerie. And it's uh, 270 specialized investigators all over the country and uh, 3,800 local correspondents. So the specialized investigators, they do uh, forensics, advanced investigations, and the local correspondents, uh, they have a much shorter training and they, uh, they're in direct contact with the victims, with the public, uh, dealing with uh, cybercrime directly uh, on the field. Um, at the top of that uh, pyramid, uh, there's a team of roughly 50 people uh, dealing with uh, uh, cybercrime on the internet, so looking for uh, crime on the internet. Or uh, my former unit, now there are 25, also dealing with uh, IT forensics. So that's the people working against cybercrime in the, in the gendarmerie, in the police. Uh, there's a similar organization uh, but they're organized in a, in a different manner, but uh, there's a specialized invest investigators against cybercrime uh, as well. Okay, so now uh, my first focus, uh, credit card fraud. So um, if we look a bit back in time, um, so these are not credit cards or these are not uh, counterfeit credit cards. Actually, it's... Uh, uh, counterfeiting of telephone cards. So uh, for for the uh, the younger ones, we we used to, yeah <laughs> we used to uh, phone in uh, phone booths. There's no longer any uh, any one of them working in Paris, um, and uh, you needed a, a special smart card that contained uh, units, uh, 120 units or 50 units. Uh, and you could make a phone call from uh, w w with that. Um, the uh, the counterfeit here uh, used uh, programmable smart cards. So at the bottom on the left, it's uh, self-made. So there's a programmable com component, uh, a programmable chip uh, of well from different manufacturers, and there's the memory. You write the program in the memory and in the in the programmable component, and uh, and then you can uh, fake uh, the functioning of a telephone card. Then they moved to uh, programmable cards, so it's all included in one uh, one card that uh, physically is just like a, a real smart smart card, but you can reprogram it. Um, and well, that's useful for people who want to make phone calls, uh, but it's not a lot of money, so they moved to uh, uh, banking cards. So uh, we had a series of evolutions uh, in credit card fraud, and the ID here, what you see on the screen, is the chip and the contacts from a programmable card that has been put on top of an, a real uh, banking card. But before doing that, they copied some of the information from the real chip on the banking card. So that no longer works, but it was an attack that was possible. Um, and uh, they just reproduced some of the uh, uh, encryption keys, uh, signature keys actually, uh, that, were, that were used on the, uh, on the smart card. Um, this is uh, another type of uh, device. It's more simple, the ID. Uh, so uh, maybe you've encountered some, it's just to copy uh, the magnetic stripe from the smart card. 
so um, and and to copy also the pin code. You you can see many of those on uh, on different websites describing how they work and how they store information or transmit information and so on. Um, the bad guys are always developing new techniques. Um, and actually, in this case, it's not the bad guys developing the techniques. It's a, a university in the UK. Uh, <laughs> and actually, it's interesting. Um, so uh, they discovered that it was possible to do a man-in-the-middle man uh, attack on uh, the dialogue between the smart card and the smart card reader. Uh, this is no longer possible, but they, uh, they found a, a flaw in, uh, in one of the first uh, implementations of, uh, of those cards in the UK and in Europe in general. Um, this is a case we had more recently in 2013. So there's uh, the technical aspect is interesting, but also the organization behind it. So the technical aspect you see from the picture, uh, the difference between the two is that on the left, uh, the card seems to be inserted of all the way inside, and on the right, ins inserted just a bit. Uh, so there's actually half the card that's uh, almost out of it. So on the left, it's a modified version of a, of a terminal that was used to copy the magnetic stripe. So to copy the full magnetic stripe, you need to, the card to go fully inside. And when the, 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 the card owner removes the card, there's a, a card, a, a magnetic stripe reader uh, that copies the, the stripe. And it's also modified keyboard. Um, actually, they plugged into the actual keyboard of, uh, of those devices. And um, they were able to copy the pin code. So normally that's not possible. Uh, actually, they, they managed to go around the, sa the safeties that were set by the uh, developer of uh, that specific type of, uh, of uh, point of sale terminal. Um, and they were able to open it. Normally, if you open it, it becomes a brick. You cannot use it anymore, but they, they found a way around it. And uh, they modified the uh, actual shape and uh, the content of the, uh, of the terminal. And then they needed to replace the point of sale terminal inside shops. So what they did, they sent people around France, around Germany, with modified devices, and they swapped the devices with the modified ones. So inside the shops, the shop owner wouldn't, wouldn't uh, notice, uh, and they were able to copy cards uh, using that process. So in that case, it's just to copy the data from the magnetic stripe and the pin code. So what that allows you to do is to re, uh, withdraw cash from cash machi machines uh, that don't use the, the pin. So that's the case in uh, many regions in the world uh, outside of Europe or outside of America, but it's less and less the case. Uh, in Southeast Asia, for instance, now there's a, the chip card is used as well. So. Uh, uh, it's not possible anymore. So in this case, it was not people from uh, our usual uh, uh, suspect areas in Europe that were behind it. It was people from Canada, from Quebec, uh, who were organizing that. And it's actually um, 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 motorbike uh, gangs who usually do uh, uh, drug trafficking and, and they, uh, they invested in the credit card fraud and they paid for people to uh, move around the world and, uh, and do that. Uh, so uh, in one, it took us one year with the Sûreté du Québec in Canada, with Europol and the BK in Germany to uh, uh, identify the guys and uh, arrest them. It was quite a, an interesting case. So that's the evolution of credit card fraud. And the, the last aspect is this one. So um, in France, we have an organization that's in charge of collecting uh, uh, numbers around fraud uh, against uh, credit card fraud. It's called the Observatory on the Payment Card uh, Safety or Security. And uh, since 2006, we've been collecting uh, information from banks. 
Uh, so that's official numbers, uh, and I extracted some of the numbers. So the actual volume of fraud um, hasn't evolved a lot. It's the, roughly the, 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 the same percentage of the, uh, of, uh, the overall uh, transactions. So uh, because we've had the uh, chip cards uh, for a long time in, in France and in Europe, so uh, uh, there's not a lot of fraud. But because there are a lot of transactions, it's still a lot of cases, uh, potentially. Uh, roughly every, every year, there, there could be uh, around uh, 1 million users that uh, uh, ask their bank to uh, uh, change their credit card because of, uh, of fraud. So the numbers on the chart, it's the evolution of the share of fraudulent transactions committed on the internet against the total number of, uh, of uh, fraudulent transactions. So in 2006, uh, we, have between, we had between 6 and 10% of uh, transactions that were uh, done illegally on the internet. Uh, today, uh, so those are the numbers from last year, um, the percentage of the total fraud on credit cards that is done on the internet for France is between 60 and 70%, depending on if you look at the, the value of the the transactions or the, the number of fraudulent transactions. So that's 70% of uh, roughly uh, uh, 2.1, 2.2 uh, million cases. So the actual evolution is we've moved from uh, fraud that was mainly uh, copying cards and using them to withdraw cash, and today it's mostly data that is stolen from online merchants and then is used on the internet. So credit card fraud is really a, a, a part of cybercrime today, even uh, more than before. The second aspect, if you look at attacks against computer systems, um, you can have the, ch the same chart in, uh, in all countries, so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that different. Uh, so if you look at uh, all the types of uh, illegal activities, uh, illegal access or malware, botnets, denial of service, uh, it's mostly international, uh, the origin of the attack. Sometimes it's local. The local attacks are mostly around fraudulent access, companies spying on each other, even in France. Uh, some malware cases originate from France, but most of the cases, the suspects are in other parts of the world. So for us, other parts of the world is uh, uh, the east of Europe, uh, North Africa, uh, sometimes South uh, America. Uh, and depending on what, what country you're uh, sitting in, the suspects are very often in another, in another country. Uh, and I suppose Russians are attacked by suspects from other parts of the world uh, as well. The um, actors, uh, and I'm going to go more in detail about that, um, it's mostly isolated people with some form of uh, organization. Uh, they work with people who, uh, who uh, do the coding. Uh, there are some script kiddies, but most of what we see is a some form of criminal ecosystem with people developing, selling, and using. And then in some cases, there's a real organized crime. And I'm going to give one example. Um, so CEO fraud uh, is something that, that has developed a lot in France uh, over the past, uh, uh, let's say, five to eight years. Uh, the idea is to convince a company uh, that you're the CEO of the company or an, imp an important uh, member of the uh, organization and you order your company uh, to send a wire transfer money uh, by hundreds of thousands of euros to an account outside the company because you need to do a transaction, because you have a contract negotiation and so on. And the, the fraudsters behind that, they use information from inside the company uh, to pretend that they're the CEO, to pretend that they, uh, 
their, um, uh, the right owners of that money or the right owners of the company or uh, that they have the right to, uh, to do that. In some of the cases uh, that were identified by Symantec in this case, um, the companies uh, that were victims were first attacked by people who were uh, supposedly based in Ukraine. So they attacked the, uh, the, um, the local network of the, the companies to get information about their banking accounts, their security procedures, uh, the names of the people working there and so on. Uh, sometimes they manage to get information to be able to uh, redirect telephone calls, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And in this case, uh, the, the people organizing the fraud were based in Israel. And then the money would go through uh, Cyprus, Malta, uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. Um, so this is the, the, the type of cases where we see a, a form of organized crime. The organized crime is mostly, in this case, based in Israel. And uh, they were using other people from Ukraine that they hired, maybe online, or maybe they met with them. I, su I suppose they met with them. Um, and, uh, and this is a typical case uh, that, that we have. And on those cases, CEO of fraud, uh, there's been hundreds of thousands of euros uh, leaving France and uh, leaving other countries. And since uh, a couple of years ago, uh, let's say three, three years ago, uh, U.S. is struck as well and uh, uh, other parts of the world. But what we see most of the time, it's not organized crime. It's more of an ecosystem of different people with different roles on the uh, internet. And uh, from developers, coders, people who uh, develop malware, uh, who find uh, vulnerabilities, who develop ex exploits uh, using those vulnerabilities, uh, who develop uh, distribution platforms, so malware distribution platforms. So they develop tools, and then you have people using them. Um, other actors are uh, managers of infrastructure, so they're going to rent uh, servers uh, inside a bulletproof hosting uh, organization, or inside an actual organization uh, that does uh, web hosting. So they're going to buy servers or rent servers and then rent them again back to the bad guys. And uh, they're going to protect their identity uh, from investigations. Uh, there's people uh, developing crime as a service. Uh, uh, for instance, a uh, credit card check. So you can check if, if a number is still valid. Uh, or people managing online mar markets. So where the bad guys meet with each other, chat online, it's mostly web forums. Um, they've moved to, um, uh, to a Tor, for instance, uh, uh, on Onion servers, but it's still web-based uh, uh, forums. And then there's people who are also useful, middlemen, uh, to do money laundering, money mules, and people who organize that. And all those people work together um, and uh, to uh, develop a botnet, for instance, so you, you need malware, you need server to distribute it, you need the server to coordinate your botnet, um, and then you're going to need people to uh, resell the information you've collected. So if you've collected passwords, uh, there's people specialized in laundering of those passwords and so on who are going to sell it for them. So actually there's actors in the cybercrime world uh, who have uh, no technical abilities. They just pick from different services. And uh, what is really important behind that um, is that for us, when we start an investigation, uh, the situation can move from uh, one day to the other. So for instance, uh, you have a victim or you have a series of victims. Uh, they've uh, downloaded malware by clicking on a link uh, from a specific server. And then uh, their passwords are sent to uh, another server. So a typical uh, uh, botnet setup. The next week, the server who is being used to distribute the malware is used to do something else, to send phishing or to, or to host phishing. 
um, or to do legitimate uh, activities, and there is no way you can uh, uh, you can investigate anymore because it's been erased. Uh, the reason is they they tend to move a lot, um, or uh, they simply want to change uh, partners uh, because they get cheaper costs or because the guys were arrested and so on. So it's a very moving environment. So just to uh, uh, illustrate that uh, a bit differently, so this is a typical setup uh, for uh, uh, ransomware distribution. Uh, you receive spam or uh, you visit a website and uh, you're redirected or your actual, actually your browser is redirected to an exploit platform or an exploit kit. And uh, without you having to click anything sometimes, uh, the computer is downloading malware and then connected to the command and control uh, server. After that, your personal data goes away or your computer is used to uh, send spam or used to uh, do a denial of service attack. In the case of ransomware, it's, uh, it's just used to collect your payment information uh, in this case. Um, in many cases, once there's one malware on the victim computer, uh, there's other malware that, are, that is going to be installed. So in this setup, you have different people managing the different aspects. So people doing the spam to distribute the links to victims, uh, people de developing the malicious uh, JavaScript uh, to redirect the victims to the exploit kits, people hacking into servers to install uh, the malicious JavaScript in this case, uh, people managing uh, actual uh, uh, advertising um, that is uh, used to redirect people as well, uh, people uh, selling the exploit kits, people who are going to install the exploit kits, and so on and so on. Different people doing the different aspects. Sometimes they've never met each other and they work together. And so that's the difficulty of the investigations today. Um, you've seen many uh, crypto lockers uh, in the press and maybe you've been victim or your me members of your families have been a victim. Um, in some cases, like in this uh, uh, French uh, news article, actually uh, the actual story com comes from elsewhere. Uh, the bad guy seems to be someone uh, uh, not very uh, motivated in the end. It looks like his mother told him to stop doing it because he says, I'm very sorry uh, that I stole uh, uh, your money and I blocked your computers. You can download all your uh, information from uh, uh, this server on mega.co.nz and uh, I will never do it again. Okay. What this shows you is that uh, in this case, the guy behind that just bought uh, a kit to distribute his uh, uh, ransomware. Um, he did not develop anything. He just uh, uh, learned how to do it on the internet and then did it and uh, made a number of victims. And that happens a lot. Uh, in those cases, it's mostly people from inside countries in Europe, inside France, inside Germany, etc., uh, who are the, uh, uh, the suspects behind that. Um, then the, the last aspect of my talk. Um, so who's heard about WannaCry? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, um, so this malware distribution is interesting uh, for many different reasons. Um, Well, one reason is uh, that officially there's uh, no one knows uh, who's behind it. Actually, uh, um, there's a police investigation going on around the world and there's been some police operations and there, there are suspects somewhere. Um, but that's not the important aspect. Um, what happened in this case is the distribution uh, model uh, was using uh, a worm-like propagation. So the, uh, the malware was moving from one machine to another directly on the internet using a, a vulnerability. 
that was actually published um, after uh, a revelation of, uh, of some uh, tools that were developed by a, uh, an agency uh, somewhere in America. <laughs> and it's okay. It, I, I can tell you a lot about uh, why uh, agencies in the US and Europe need tools and uh, why that's necessary. The, the problem is uh, it was, the vulnerability was published in the end. And once the vulnerability is published, it is exploited. Okay? Um, and it is exploited very quickly. In this case, it was uh, exploited to distribute malware uh, such as a crypto locker. It could have been used to, uh, to do spying and so on. Um, and it could happen to a French agency, it could happen to a, a German agency and so on. So uh, let's, let's be modest. Uh, so what happened, uh, and it's very different from what we uh, used to have uh, in, the, uh, in the, the past few years, the malware was going from one machine to another. And in practice, it looks like uh, they tested it on uh, Thursday. Friday, they started spreading it. And Friday evening, it was all over the planet. Uh, that usually never happens. Okay. Um, and those are the infections that were uh, measured uh, during the weekend. So Thursday, some tests. There are some traces of the tests. Uh, Friday, the actual launch of the, of the uh, spreading, and then it moved from one point in the world to the whole world. And uh, you see victims in Russia, potentially China, Ukraine, France, Canada, US, and so on. Uh, so France was uh, uh, actually a, a big victim. The victims we had uh, were people uh, having a machine uh, directly connected to the internet. And that's not very common. Uh, usually people in France connect to the internet uh, behind what we call a, an internet box. And uh, you're not directly connected to the internet and uh, un unless you put your machine on, on the, the DMZ, uh, it cannot be attacked from the internet directly. It's not a proper firewall and so on, but it's, it's some protection. Uh, in other countries, it's not always the case. People just plug in behind the, the modem and the ADSL modem, and uh, uh, that's why they're spreading in different regions. So the cases we had in France, it's people who are using those machines to uh, collect um, ca um, surveillance camera information. And uh, it's something we see more and more often. It's devices that you plug in somewhere that you configure quickly. You, you actually don't know what you're configuring. And it works because you can see, uh, so you can see what's going on on your smartphone. Hey, I can see the camera from my home. Everything is safe. The problem is your network is not safe anymore. And that happens to companies, that happens to, uh, uh, to private people. Actually, one, one of the victims was a, a, a boulangerie. You know what a boulangerie is? A bakery. A bakery, exactly. So a place where you can buy good stuff in the morning and uh, so they had the uh, cameras to protect the store and actually they were uh, directly connected to the internet. So th those were Windows machines, uh, but in other cases there are Linux machines uh, with basic uh, BusyBox, for instance, uh, or, or different types of setup that, that, ca that can be used. Uh, so actually the victims were not victim of much uh, uh, because the information that was encrypted was just videos of uh, surveillance in, in most cases. That, but that was for WannaCry. Uh, other attacks were um, more, more damageable. Um, so that's an interesting evolution. Uh, fast uh, distribution. Uh, it's not on actual computers, it's on devices that are used to, uh, uh, to store uh, web surveillance to that you just something you just plug in your home uh, we've seen also cases in Europe of uh, ac actual TV sets that are bricked 
uh, because of ransomware. So you, uh, you know, you can have a TV set with Android on it, with uh, LG. I don't, I don't remember the, the name of the OS, etc. Well, if it's Android, uh, there's Android malware, and it, it can also attack uh, the TV. And if you have a, a 2,000 euro TV that just shows uh, that sort of screen, it's not very useful anymore. <laughs> so, uh, um, so one message actually to um, a community like you is that security is really important. Uh, systems that can be updated. Um, helping people uh, that install systems to secure the, uh, their uh, environment, to secure their systems is really important. Uh, if something is easy to set up, it needs to be easy to update, easy to secure. Uh, otherwise, it's not, uh, it becomes dangerous. Okay. So that's one of the major messages for today. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Um, so you you know what you have on your machine, right? Um, so what what happens on a Tor relay is that it's not set up to collect any type of information; it's just set up to to be a relay. Uh, so for law enforcement, it's not very interesting uh, to see the computer. Uh, there's other strategies that can be developed uh, to, to be able to, uh, to identify suspects on, uh, on Tor networks. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, you've seen cases in the press of people who've been arrested, uh, their servers, their hidden servers have been seized. So law enforcement is working and is able to, in some cases, to uh, identify the bad guys. So the bad guys is some of the people who are using your uh, relay but they're, they're also using the internet. We're not going to seize the whole internet and, and so on. So, um, but, so that's the technical answer. Of course, uh, there's nothing wrong with you running a Tor relay. Uh, but it also means uh, that uh, uh, a high level of the activity on Tor, from the point of view of countries like France, is illegal activities. In other countries uh, where it's uh, uh, not a democracy, it's used mostly to protect private conversations, not to be arrested by the police who are actually going against people who express themselves. In France, what we see is that most of the activities on tour is around, around selling drugs, uh, selling malware, etc. So you, you need to be aware that part of what is going on on tour is uh, not for good reasons, but that's for you as a message, not for, uh, yeah. And maybe in some cases, if you can help law enforcement, if you have information, then it's up to you. Maybe you should be able to, to share it. I know it's not on your tour server, but maybe uh, you can see other types of information that, that can be helpful. Another question over there? Yeah. So in your earlier slide, you said that you see less organized crime, and you see associations of newer people committing crimes. So, I'm, I mean, can you say more about that? Because that seems to not be what we see, for instance, in other parts of the world. So, in Russia or in other ah, other okay. Um, where should I? Actually, in other presentations, I have more examples, but even in, if you look at uh, criminals from Russia, um, usually when, uh, when uh, groups are arrested that come from uh, Eastern Europe or Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, and so on, 
Uh, it's not more than four or five people uh, that, that are identified. Some of them just know each other uh, um, on the internet and some have met. But in many cases, it's isolated people. In some cases, it's really organized group. They even set up companies uh, to do their uh, illegal activities. Uh, and yes, in that case, they're very often hidden in a country where it's uh, difficult to get cooperation from. So uh, it exists, but the, the, the huge volume of the activity, for instance, from uh, those countries at the east of Europe, it's people selling tools for others to use. They're not really uh, uh, managing botnets and so on. And there are some individual groups managing very large botnets or, or larger activities. Uh, but in many cases, they don't really know each other. So it's not the typical definition of organized crime as we would have it in the past, like the mafia uh, that we have in, uh, in Europe, uh, in Italy or in France and so on, uh, with a, a big structure and a pyramid structure with a big boss at the top <coughs> and so on. So it's not typical criminal organizations. And thus, it makes it difficult for us to investigate because we have special tools for uh, uh, criminal organizations. Uh, we can uh, go, um, investigate faster. We have access to uh, uh, tools to uh, like wiretaps, like undercover investigations and so on. And in some cases, it's not available for us uh, in cybercrime. That's the, that's the idea. Yes? Thanks for your uh, presentation. I was just wondering if you let's say, for you stop the, you know, let's say, for student kind of parts of state cyber, and cyber crime, you know, you've got the people who are fighting this, like yourselves, and then there's people who are, let's say, uh, doing intelligence work, let's say, and generating tools that uh, exploit vulnerabilities in <coughs> commonly used operating systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there rooms in the EU or in France that to try and standardize where if uh, one organization in a country is aware of a vulnerability that the population is exposed to, mm -hmm. and there's a timeline for actually disclosing that responsibly to members so mm -hmm. the general population won't be put at risk? Uh, is there any rooms like that? Um, so there's no actual solution in place? But uh, the debate is on the table, and uh, it's the kind of debate we have uh, with the European Commission at the moment on uh, uh, how we should uh, deal with those. So the first answer is no, but yes, we're talking about it. 